So we'll start with our first speaker today. If you could help me welcome Luke Wakeley. He's going to talk to us this morning on growing together, experience of parenting a premature infant in a rural area. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, Amanda. Um, I thought it was great to hear Sir Harry speak about frontline clinicians and consulting with frontline clinicians for health and issues this morning because this presentation um, hopefully sort of builds on that as well. Um, and so I want to talk today about what was my PhD research um, and what I did was it was a qualitative study and we did a thematic analysis and had these lovely themes and um, lovely experiences of, of these uh, families from rural areas and then at the end of that I sort of said well so what well, how does this apply to clinicians and as a paediatric physiotherapist who was working with premature families of premature infants in a rural area that's what I wanted out of the PhD and so I developed a model that I wanted to sort of talk to you about today. Um, so premature birth is the le leading cause of disability in children worldwide, I missed out in children there. Um, and rural communities experience premature birth at higher rates compared to metropolitan communities. So we have higher um, rates of premature birth, yet the services um, for these families are metropolitan based. So there's no neonatal intensive care units outside of a metro centre in Australia. Um, and most of the support, the follow up services that specialise in uh, care of premature infants and their families are also based in metro areas. Uh, we know that rural-based services are often generalists, and then when you look at um, our lovely Indigenous communities, that there's even much higher rates, um, almost to the, um, double the rate of um, premature birth in our Indigenous communities, yet there's very few services around. And so thus our, our rural families um, have to parent their premature infants that often have complex health needs, um, and without the local support, well, the other thing that they often have to do is travel really vast distances to access those services. So my research question was, what is the lived experience of, par of a parenting a premature infant in a rural area? And I was really interested in that parenting aspect, that day-to-day, -day, um, you know, what's their day-to-day -day life like, trying to support these children. And so obviously that was the aim, is to gain that in-depth understanding of parenting a premature infant. Um, I used phenomenology of practice, which was the guiding methodology, uh, because I, again, sought to understand those pre-reflective, everyday sort of lived experiences, so what they were doing every day with these children. <clears throat> uh, to be included in the study, they had to identify as having parented a premature infant. Um, we didn't define parent, a parent any further than that, which was um, a good thing because we had... Um, it meant that if they'd identified as parenting, so it could have been a grandmother or um, another relative or someone who thought that they'd parented that child and they could be included in the study. Um, it just meant that families are often quite heterogeneous in their makeup and it meant we were inclusive of that. Um, and we did have one um, participant who managed to foster 57 children, so we were able to include her, which was great. Uh, they had to have lived in a rural area during the first two years of their child's life, which we defined as modified Monash 3 or higher. And uh, we had one participant who had given birth in a metro area and then had uh, moved to a, a rural area during that first two years, but the rest had all lived, were living in a rural area at, this, at the time. And their premature infant had to be between 12 months and 7 years of age, and they had to be able to speak English well enough to participate in the interview. Um, there was a really considerable period of community consultation and so we were really careful with the communities we went to because we did go to some remote communities and that was, had to be really careful about how we went about the research there because um, there was literally no services for them. So to ask questions about what follow-up services they had, we, we could have actually sort of um, really opened up some wounds there or, or illustrated to them that they were missing out on something that they weren't aware of. So uh, we did a lot of community consultation and... Um, we wanted to be really inclusive of the Indigenous populations, the communities within those, um, within those centres. So we did a lot of um, community consultation with the local Aboriginal populations to make sure that we, we sort of um, went about the research in a really culturally sensitive way. Um, so participants were sent or handed a recruitment pack from um, either a metropolitan NICU, 
a rural community health service or an Aboriginal arts research program. And those people um, talked about the research, and I had to be distanced from it because I'm a, I was a clinician working with these families at the time, so couldn't recruit them directly. They each participated in two semi-structured interviews, and then we transcribed those. Um, and they were also asked to bring a photograph or a memento of the, that represented the experience to them to the interviews, um, which majority did. We analysed the data thematically, um, and the thematic analysis will be the subject of another publication. Um, and we did lots of um, reflection using process and reflection diaries on what was coming through and how, you know, my influence on that data. And developed, we, once, the develop, once we, I'd conducted the thematic analysis, as I said, I wanted to sort of have something concrete that um, sort of could guide clinicians in their, in their practice. And so I developed up a model, which I'll show you. So our participants were, there were 16 participants, there was 13 mothers and three fathers. Uh, for anyone looking to recruit to this type of study, all three fathers were dragged along by their wives. Um, so um, it, was, it was good to sort of have that, that um, ability. We kept it really flexible in terms of whether they wanted to be interviewed separately or together with their partner and that sort of thing. Um, four mothers identified as Aboriginal, um, didn't get to speak to any uh, Aboriginal dads, which is a real sort of source for future research. Um, three married couples, um, and the participants ranged in age from 19 um, to 39 years at the time of the birth of their child. The children were born between 24 weeks and 33 weeks gestation and the birth weight of the children were 530 to 2,800 grams. So we got a real nice sort of spread, so, which is what we're after. Uh, this is where they came from. So um, we got across a range of the um, modified Monash areas. As I said, one person was uh, that had gave birth in a, met, a city and then moved to the rural area, but we did get quite a variety there, which was which was great. And so, after the thematic analysis, this was the essence that came out of it. And so, it was reducing the distance, creating the parenting space. And so, the parenting space is that intersubjective space where the practice of parenting occurred. So, I often think of it. I've got four kids, um, and so. Um, when you go home, it's, it's often chaos. And so if, um, let's say, someone has done, I don't know who, the, but has um, maybe clean, cooked dinner, and then that means I can spend time with the children, well, that is the creation of parenting space. So that's that intersubjective space where maybe the, um, all the other competing things that compete for your attention as a parent um, might go away, and so you have the time to devote to just the practice of parenting. And I do understand that the practice of parenting does involve things like hooking dinner for the child on those day-to-day -day things, but um, it, those, those things can also be a distractor. And, um, and when it came to premature infants, it was often the distractor of um, attending medical appointments or understanding information or um, having to deal with health professionals and those sorts of things as well. So there was a huge amount of distract distractions which could reduce that, um, which would reduce the creation of that parenting space. Whereas, and if there, there was a reduction in that parenting space and there was the creation of distance between the parent and the child. And so um, what I'm advocating for is that if we can look at clinical practices reducing that distance, then we're going to create the space for that parent, the parenting of these children. Um, so, that. so this was the model um, which I named the parenting of practice kids model um, and kids was the key interactions of distance and space. And so you can see central to that is the practice of parenting. Um, and then we've got these other forms of distance that came out of the data. So once I looked at it and sort of worked out what these forms of distance were, and they do relate to sort of as existential things like who, where and when, um, and I've sort of categorised those up as well to sort of direct people to that. Um, and so I'll go through the different forms of distance and explain those in a second. but. Um, one of the things to think of is that if something that we do as an interaction might reduce that distance with, between the child and the parent, then we're going to create that practice, that space for the practice of parenting. And so it's just a source for reflection on clinical practice that it might help guide us. Uh, so the most critical form of distance was the parent-infant relationship. Um, and so that was the, that sort of encompasses that relation and the bonding and that sort of thing of the, between the parent and the child. Um, and this had the most direct influence on um, the parent-child um, intersubjective space. So that if, if we influenced that, then there was a direct influence on the, the space for the practice of parenting. 
And so you see this mother here said that she tried to put herself away from her daughter, um, didn't nurse her as much, didn't spend time with her because um, she was preparing herself emotionally for what might happen to this child. And so this child she'd been at home with, had been going well, um, and all of a sudden went downhill quite rapidly and was very, very unwell. And um, so ambulance trip to the hospital at the local rural centre, helicopter trip out back to... Um, or plane trip, sorry, but down to the metro centre. And so she was preparing for the worst and bringing herself away. So you can see that she was increasing that distance between herself and the child and so and reducing that um, space for the practice of parenting. And the nice thing was, well, the not nice thing, but the, uh, there was a lovely little intervention from one of the health professionals that sort of talked to her through that and then said, no, you need to be there for your child. And so she was able to do that um, and so then reduce that distance and increase that parenting space. Um, another form of distance that came out was physical distance and there was two sort of main parts to this. Um, being a study on rural families, one of the biggest distances was geographical and so often the common setup was that the child would be in a metropolitan NICU during their NICU stay. Um, usually the mum would stay down there with them, the dad would have to go back and work or manage the property. Um, and it was really interesting to look at the impact of living on the land because the, those, you know, you can't get someone to sort of come in and work your shift for you sort of thing, so they had to get back. And so there was a separation there, um, a geographical separation. Or alternatively, this father was talking about having to travel constantly to um, access appointments for, their, for his son. And, um, and that he felt that just the time in the car, and you know that if you've done a, this, is a, this was a four hour each way trip, um, the time in the car you're quite exhausted, so imagine for a premature baby who's got really fragile health, that that had an impact on his health. And this father directly equated his child's uh, subsequent cerebral palsy to the travel sort of thing, so whether or not that was actually the case, but that was true for him. And the, again, the other side of physical distance was um, physical intimacy with the child. And so the practice of parenting with a baby is often physically intimate. We, we cuddle them, we breastfeed them, um, you know, and that, that sort of thing. So, um, and often these parents, um, because of the premature birth, had a physical barrier between, and distance between the child. So it could have been the distance of just the, the glass of the humidity crib, but that, was a real, that really impacted on that parenting. And so they were the two physical distance aspects. And then there was relational distance with others, which is the, um, the relationship with other people, which included their partner, uh, their other kids, um, health, other health professionals, and then extended family and friends. And so th one of the key things here was empathy, and if the, 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 uh, whoever that other was understood the experience and could empathise with that to some extent, then usually w their interactions then reduced that distance and created that space for parenting. Um, and so, whereas if they didn't, then that, that had the opposite effect. So you can see this mother here was explaining that um, when some of her friends wanted to come over and visit the new baby, that they, she would give them a barrage of questions because she was so paranoid about her child getting an infection. And so, um, and that was often quite off-putting for the, if they had, didn't understand why she was asking that question and just thought that, you know, her friends were germy. Whereas... Um, Again, this second quote, this talk, uh, mother was talking about where she was having a really hard time um, and couldn't sort of comprehend it and, this, and a nurse sat down with her and gave her a cuddle and sort of explained a few things that were going on and so a mother could sort of get her head around that that was distracting her and then she had that space for the practice of parenting her child. Um, and so the key aspect of that was empathy and understanding and one of the interesting parts of that was that when the... NICU birth happens away from the rural area that it's really hard for people who aren't there to actually empathise what's happened with these families. Uh, cognitive emotional distance was um, the self-perception or the feelings about their life as a parent. And so uh, you can see with this mum is that she was um, reflecting back about her teaching career and, and that she sort of had this plan of, um, she actually spoke about wanting to be a principal in um, of a school at some stage and that with the birth of her child um, born prematurely, that all of those career plans were now gone by the wayside. And so, um, and if she was reflecting on that and saying, geez, what if, then obviously that sort of increased the distance between her and the child and so reduced that practice of parenting because she was concentrating on what could have been. Whereas if their cognitive emotional distance was that this is, you know, there was a positive aspect to that then and they could look at the positives of their parenting and their, and their um, emotional sort of 
stay with the child, then that increased that space for parenting. Um, domicile distance was a really important one and I think it illustrated why research like this is important because um, as a clinician I had some assumptions about this which I found out were wrong and so domicile distance is the distance from the familiar and so one of the assumptions I had was that um, when families would go down to the NICU in a metropolitan area that they would be really happy to come back to the rural area because they'd be back to the familiar and back to, um, back to being you know, close to their support and close to home. Um, and in fact, most, in most cases, the opposite was true, is that they, when they went down to the NICU, they actually bonded with that NICU and had all that specialised support there that they started to rely on. So coming back to the rural area is actually really traumatic for these families. And, um, and so um, you can see that they had, you know, this mother saying they had all the up-to-date equipment and everything's working like clockwork, and then they come back and they're worried about infections and, um, and because it's often a lower level of care um, because it's a, it's a step down in that NICU process. And so um, being close to the familiar was really important for these families and because they weren't having to deal with something unfamiliar, then they could concentrate on parenting their child. But what we had to be really aware of is what was familiar for the, for the family and, what, and that, that changed over time. Uh, so temporal distance was um, the distance between their perception of time and the, flow of, the actual flow of time. And so um, this tended to happen two ways, is when they wanted time to slow down, that it, was re it went really quickly. So if um, they were having to make a decision about um, whether to have steroids for the baby or, or um, is, you know, the, the premature birth was coming, when they spoke about that, that was paced very quickly and that things were happening quicker than they could process sort of thing. And the information they were giving, they weren't in a space to process that. And so they certainly weren't in a space to parent their child. <coughs> As opposed to they, the parents spoke about times waiting for their child to establish breastfeeding or waiting for their child to take their first steps and those sorts of things and that's when time happened really slowly. So it was the difference between their perception of time and how time was flowing. And so if they were getting frustrated by things happening too slowly or they were getting stressed out by things happening too quickly to process, then that reduced that space for the practice of parenting. So there were additional stresses and barriers to, to parenting posed simply by living rurally, um, and they did impact negatively in the most case on the practice of parenting. Um, and these are, the, these are the families that may have the least resources to deal with the, these additional stresses as well. And so I think we need to be really aware of those clinicians working in these in rural areas is that, is that we're dealing with these families in a, in a really complex, we're dealing with something complex. Interestingly, the research is suggesting that the parental side of that parent-infant relationship may have the greater impact, and so some systematic reviews that have looked at um, mental health problems in mothers and that sort of stuff and the impact of bonding are saying that the, that parental aspect can have a real um, impact on that, and if you look at our support services, most of them are geared towards supporting the child. And so using these forms of distance, I'm hoping that... Um, that we can reflect on our interactions with these families and work out whether what we're doing is increasing or decreasing that distance um, and, that, and, and subsequently that space for the practice of parenting. So at the moment, moving forward, we're continuing with community consultation for further areas of exploration. Um, I really want to sort of talk to more dads, in particular some Indigenous fathers, and so I'm looking at other ways to recruit dads. And we need to look at this broader. So this, was, this um, was rural and remote areas in New South Wales, and obviously the experience may be different in other areas of Australia. Um, and just to acknowledge the late Professor Diana Keating, who was a supervised part of this research, and um, the participants in the communities who shared their stories um, with me, and the University of Newcastle Department of Rural Health, who was just a wonderful support getting through this research. Thanks. Thank you.